want to share with you about that. And this is a series where it goes through and talks about a journey that we all go through in life. And there's really nothing that plagues me more in my spiritual life than me. Just to be quite honest, you know, I actually am the cause of most of my heartache. I am the cause of most of indecision and just bad happenings in my life. Meaning as I go from the event that I got to and I go backwards, pretty much 100% of the time, it's me that created cause, didn't listen, didn't, just didn't have a heart to follow through on what God desired for me. And oftentimes in my life, I've even gotten to a point where I wanted to believe that it was someone else's fault. I know no one else does that. I believe it's just me that believes that sometimes. But there's even been times in my life where I thought it was God's fault. So no one else has done that either, right? I didn't think so. So in going through this today, I wanted to talk about having a decided heart because there's really a process to this. And the first one is this, is I have to have perseverance in the life that I'm living. And it can be in my spiritual life. It can be in my personal life. Any goal that I have before me, whether it be business or whichever, I have to persevere, meaning I'm going to have to take some responsibility and I'm going to have to control the thoughts and emotions that I put into it and realize that It's me that it matters with. The buck does stop with me and most everything that I endeavor to do. That doesn't mean that I don't need the help of others and specifically the help of God, but it does mean that I've got to make that decision to do it and take responsibility for it. I can't blame my parents, my teachers, my spouse, my kids, or anyone else. Although some days that would be so nice and convenient. I mean, seriously. Also, I'm going to have to seek guides for that trip, meaning I'd love to think that in this area there's all the wisdom of the world, but the truth is, is the longer I live, the more impressed I am with what I don't know than what I do know. And so it is very vitally important that not only do I take responsibility for my life and my goals and the things that I'm going after in life, but I need to find people to help me and give me wise guidance on that trip. And also, I need to be a person of action. My favorite thing when I was 17 years as a pastor, I hated committee meetings. I'm just going to be honest. Because we'd end them with prayer and we all felt like we accomplished something. Don't get me wrong. Prayer is a lot. But we never took action. It would be like, well, we've prayed about it. We've talked about it. We can all go home. No one else deals with that? It's just me again? It happens at your house, too. I mean, doesn't it? Don't you guys sit down around the table? Well, we've talked about it. We can now eat. No, I mean, seriously. But a person of action is different, meaning they're courageous. They choose. They take the moment and they go. And, and really what we find in our world is more everybody waiting for somebody to do that. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, I think that everybody's just kind of watching to see, okay, who's going to actually have the courage to do this? And so I actually believe it's going to be somebody that has a decided heart that's going to be the one that leads that. But I also believe in, we're in a world where it's, John Maxwell called it the magnetic pole, uh, meaning that when you have a majority that likes and is comfortable with status quo, anyone that's trying to break from it has to first get out of that tractor beam that's trying to pull them back into it. Have you ever experienced that, where you had this idea and uh, you want to run with it? Sometimes you might need to be pulled back in. My wife will tell you that. But... At other times, you're trying to get something going, and everyone's like, but wait, we're comfortable. We like it the way it is. Yeah, I read this one study about how America could change gas prices by two bucks, but it would make us uncomfortable for one week. So do we do it? No, because I actually believe if you did the math, you would see it would work. Because, you know what, this is total conspiracy theory, but this is true right now. When I lived in Alaska, it cost 33 cents to make a gallon of gas. I haven't paid under a buck since I was 18. And I know I look like I'm 27, but... (laughs) No, I'm kidding. (laughs) All right. Hey, I want you to know, first off, when we look at this, what a decided heart kind of looks like. This is a little bit humorous, and I've loved it for years now. But I'm going to ask Bill if he would show... Mike, you got this? He's back there, actually. So good job, Michael. Go ahead and roll that. But it's it's a video of what a decided heart looks like. No, what I love about that is in the middle of everything that's going on, uh, glaciers being formed and everything else, all he can think about is that crazy nut, okay? He's, that's all he's got his mind on, and he's going after that. And I know in life that sometimes when you're that focused on something, you do need counseling. I'll be the first to acknowledge that. But I also know in life that what you focus on is what you get. And most of the time, the best we focus on in our spiritual life is below mediocre, 
the best we focus on in our personal life. And you, you can add any goal you want to that, whether it be fitness, financial, business, you name it. Usually we focus on mediocre or less. We compare ourselves to others or whatever else, and we allow someone else to establish what we focus on. And so what I want you to think about for just a few moments, if you grab this packet, there is some questions on the back because today we are going to take some time to converse and work together. But this first one is this. It's questions for you on personal reflection because before we really get into what we're going to talk about, I want you to think about your own life first. So we have approximately four minutes. There's just some music that's going to play really light, but I want you to go through, and there's four questions there. You've got about a minute for each one. This is what I want to encourage you to do, is don't cheat yourself, because if you don't answer the questions, then today's going to seem pretty silly, and you're going to say, gosh, I wish Mike was here. And then, but if you actually answer these, we're going to actually make some ground this morning, and something could, could happen. So before we do that, we're going to pray, and then I'm going to ask you to take on these four questions, and then we'll get after it. So, Jesus, I just want to thank you for this morning, and I thank you for the opportunity we have to really look at our life. And Lord, I'm going to just pray on the, the front end of this morning for myself, because I know if I'm guilty of anything, it's, it's short-selling or under-believing or doubting the, the rich blessings that you have for my life. It's, it's just me oftentimes accepting what others have for me instead of, or even what I think you have for me instead of what you really do. And so, God, I pray for myself this morning, and I pray for each person here, that somehow, in this moment, we could separate from the worries of this day and this coming week, that we could just for this moment be able to focus in on you and the life that you've blessed us with, and that in this time, we would have the freedom to hear with with ears like yours and see with eyes like yours and have the heart to be courageous and the heart to dream, and the heart to have faith, and the heart to believe that your love is so terrific and huge that we can live a life without fear. I pray that this morning would be a free morning where real life change can occur. And for whatever triumphs we experience as a group or individually, God, we just give you the glory for that knowing that it's by your presence, through your spirit here, that we are encouraged, enlightened, and inspired for the great future that you have for each one of us. We pray this in your name, Jesus. But first off, I want you to just take a quick journey with me through some scriptures and some other things that are going to help us consider this, because here's the goal. When you walk out of here today, I hope that with the help of someone else that's here and and the presence of God himself, you walk out with something that's going to change your life. Because I absolutely believe that, yeah, you've heard the saying, a journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. The journey to huge life change begins with one choice, one piece of action, one thing. The one thing I can do today that's going to make a difference for tomorrow And if I do that every day, just think, in one year's time, I have 365 things that are making a huge difference in my life. Okay, think about this. It's nice to believe there is a middle between do and do not. Isn't there? It really is. And because Disney has rebought Star Wars, we're going to get some more do or do not. Isn't that awesome? But I want you to think about it for a second because I think we're plagued in our society to believe that it's really okay to be in between. And we're plagued to believe that somehow being in between is good. That somehow it keeps us in a place where we have options. I don't need to make a decision because it's better for me to be here to have options. Plus the convenient thing about it is, is if it doesn't work out either way, at least I don't have to be blamed for it. It doesn't have to be my fault. It's obviously someone else's fault. Most likely it's the president, a parent, or someone else because usually they don't know nothing. And sometimes that may be true. But most of the times it's because I refuse to take action. Because I want to live in this nice, comfortable land of called trying or thinking or whichever. And again, trying and thinking, I want to put those in a context for you. Because there is such thing as trying, but I don't believe in trying just to fail. I believe in doing something because you have to get somewhere. Now the examples of this are huge. And I think we've shared this before. Tiger Woods, like him or not like him, he is a great golfer. Do you think he got that way by golfing nine holes once a week? If you've seen Tiger Woods' practice schedule, I would learn to hate golf 
on that schedule. Because every day for one hour, all he does is hit putts from 10 feet. And then he goes for another hour from this far, this far, this far. And then he'll go to the driving range, and all he does is this for one hour. And I'm thinking, oh, that's crazy. But that is what it took for him to become a great golfer. If you talk to Kellen Moore, a name that everybody in this room should know, or there is the door. (laughs) You know I'm joking, but you know who Kellen Moore is. Kellen Moore was actually, you probably saw the interview, was asked, well, Kellen, how so young did you get to the point where you understand football so well? And you've probably read it. From the age of 12, he was ordering playbooks from college football teams off of eBay and reading them like textbooks. In fact, he showed up, according to Coach Pete, he showed up to the Broncos the first day he was there. He knew the playbook better than some of the coaches for the Broncos. And their first question was, is how do you know that? And he pulled out their playbook, and they said, where did you get that? eBay. So... Yeah, it wasn't supposed to leave, but it, it did. So, and he was asked, well, what did it take? And he says, well, mastery takes 10,000 hours, and I've put well more than 10,000 hours into studying football. Okay, so what we're getting at is this. A decided heart takes some effort. When you have a decided heart, it just doesn't happen to happen to you like magic, because I do believe we like magic beans. We like microwave, fast food, you got it. We want it now. But the truth is a decided heart journey leads you to something that's bigger than microwave burritos. It's bigger than McDonald's food. You understand where I'm going with this? It's bigger than just, I got it. Meaning it's something every day. It's an absolute commitment that what it takes, I am going to keep going. And it's not trying. It's a committed, consistent effort. It's a decision that I've made. It means I have decided. I want you to consider this with me as well. This is right out of the book, The Traveler's Gift. And I'm going to read it to you. You can follow along with me. I would just try to summarize it, but I think it loses a lot of effect when I do that. So I'm going to read through it. Read with me, if you would. A wise man once said, A journey of a thousand miles begins with one single step. Knowing this to be true, I'm taking my first step today. For too long, my feet have been tentative, shuffling left and right, back and forward as my heart gauged the direction of the wind. Criticism, condemnation, and complaint are creatures of the wind. They come and go on the wasted breath of lesser beings and have no power over me. The power to control my direction belongs to me. Today I will begin to exercise that power. My course, it has been charted. My destiny is assured. I have a decided heart. I am passionate about my vision for the future. I will awaken every morning with an excitement about the new day and its opportunity for growth and change. My thoughts and actions will work in a forward motion, never sliding into the dark forest of doubt or the muddy quicksand of self-pity. I will freely give my vision for the future to others, and as they see the belief in my eyes, they will follow me. I will lay my head on my pillow at night happily exhausted, knowing that I have done everything within my power to move the mountains in my path. As I sleep, the same dream that dominates my waking hours will be with me in the dark. Because yes, I I do. I have a dream. It's a great dream. And I will never apologize for it. Never will I ever let it go. For if I did, my life would be finished. My hopes, my passions, my vision for the future are my very existence. A person without a dream never had a dream come true. I have a decided heart. I will not wait. I know that the purpose of analysis is to come to a conclusion. I've tested the angles. I have measured the probabilities. And now I have made a decision with my heart. I am not timid. I will move now and not look back. When I put what I put off until tomorrow, I will put off until the next day as well. I do not procrastinate. All my problems become smaller when I confront them. If I touch a thistle with caution, it will prick me. But if I grasp it boldly, its spines crumble into dust. I will not wait. I am passionate about my vision for the future. My course has been charted, and my destiny is assured. 
All right, when you flip over, there's some review there, but then also we're going to get into those verses that are right there too and spend some time talking about those. Because what I want to suggest to you right now is, is what Andy Andrews is, not, is sharing in that, that is not anything that's new. I mean, King Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. But what I want you to hear is this, is that the promises that are right there and the decisions that you can make with your life are going to require a faith in something bigger than yourself. Because if your opportunities are as big as you, you're capable of a lot. But wouldn't you rather be beyond that? It also is going to require that I take some time to evaluate and understand and know exactly where I'm heading. It's amazing the number of people that walk the earth today that have no idea where they're going, but they go somewhere. It's just somewhere someone else has decided for them. But most of all, it's realizing that God has always had a plan for you and I, a plan for this church, a plan for the people who walk this earth that is so much bigger than even the Broncos. So much bigger than. You fill in the blank. It just keeps going. There is a plan in place that you and I can be a part of that's absolutely fantastic. There is a plan for your life that you would prosper. Now, prosper doesn't mean you drive a Porsche. However, if God wanted me to, I'd happily do it. And it does mean this, though. Prosper means this. You can see good come from yourself towards others. There's no more prosperity in the world than having the ability to bless others. Your life can be full of joy. Mike shared with you a few weeks ago, one of the challenges we gave the teens was to wake up every morning and laugh for five seconds. And the fun part was to see how crazy other people would think we were. But you know what is true? Is is when you start the day with a choice to have a happy day, you usually have a happy day. There was times in Caitlin's young life we sent her back to bed. Because we believed well, how you get out of bed is usually how you live your day. There are all these opportunities that you, you and I have, and I'm afraid that we actually believe that somehow, something, or in some way, God is keeping it from us. When in reality, I see a completely different God. I see a completely different Jesus than I think most people believe is there. He has no interest in making life miserable for me. I do that on my own pretty easily. He has every interest in freeing me to this gargantuanly huge, blessed life that's just sitting there. But I let other things and myself get in the way. So I want to talk to you briefly because the question that we were just posed is this. Are you ready to move and not look back and know the power of a decided heart? Okay, first, how we get sidetracked. I want to talk to you about pretending. Pretending is something that I think happens very, I'll take, I think it happens all around us. In Mark, there's a story about Jesus. Let's read that together. I'm going to read just 13 and 14 first, those two verses, and then we'll, come, we'll talk a moment and then go back. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, meaning it had leaves on it, and it was in the right season where there should have been fruit on it as well, he went out, he went out to see if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not in season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat your fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. What was interesting to me when I always read that, I always wondered why would it matter to Jesus so much. And the more I think about things... Hold on one second. And the more I thought about it in my life, I came to realize that there's so many times that that my life has leaves but no real substance. Meaning a, a tree is nice to look at, but without any fruit, it really has nothing to offer. And if the greatest prosperity in life is our ability to bless others and our ability to live life to its fullest, then a fig tree with just leaves is so far short of what a fig tree should be. And so when you look at a fig tree faith, it looks good and even impressive from a distance because Jesus probably saw it. Maybe the disciples saw the tree and said, man, check out that fig tree. Have you ever had that experience where you walked up to something that looks so good from a distance and you thought that when you got to it, you were going to be just grandly impressed with what it had to offer? Like the 49ers. And then you realize, you realize that, oh, it's just a bunch of guys with red and gold on. So, no. But you've had that experience. 
You had that experience, haven't you? I, you remember the first Batman when Michael Keaton was Batman and how he had muscles? I don't know. But I drove, I grew up in Baker City, Oregon. When that movie came out, I was so inspired. I drove with one of my buddies from Baker for the opening day because we had to see Batman. And I walked in and we went to it and I left so disappointed. It just didn't meet my expectations. It was a total fig tree faith kind of thing because I was expecting it to be completely different. I was expecting the Michael Keaton Batman to be the the Christian Bale Batman that came 20 years later because God is faithful. And so, (laughs) but I remember on the way home, we dropped by McDonald's and people were looking at us and they said, where are you guys from? And it was because I was wearing my Baker City baseball cap. And we said, Baker. They said, oh, well, what are you doing here? Oh, we drove to Boise to see Batman. Well, that was silly. And we said, yes, it was. <laughs> so you can see we've all had those life experiences. And I'm giving you silly ones, but take it to a serious one. Sometimes you meet a person that looks like they're full of substance only to discover there is none. Sometimes you, you go to an organization that looks like it's full of substance to find out there is none. The deeper you get into it, the more you realize it's all flash in a pan, smoke and mirrors. You can give it any definition you want, but there is no substance to it. The old term that we hear in the church all the time is it's a mile wide and an inch deep. It looks great from the top of the hill, but when you get into it, there's nothing there. One of of the terms I hear often is plastic. It looks really good and durable, but there's no real to it. It just seems to be there. And I even run into people that think pretending is adjusting. You know, if you heard the saying, just pretend you got it till you do. I don't know if I agree with that. Just keep going until you have it. But pretending. Pretending is this. Pretending you can look like you're there when you're really not. Have you ever noticed that? You can look like you're there when you're really not. You can convince yourself you're somebody that you're not. You can pretend and make yourself look like you fit when you really don't. You can look like a fig tree but not have figs. You can look like a follower of Christ but have no Christ. And so while that comes down to this, is what does it look like when you're decided? Because Jesus didn't just leave it at that point. He kept going with the disciples later on in the chapter. And this is what he said. Peter remembered and said, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. I know everyone puts that to the test with things like money, cars, and every, you know, whatever else, a better dishwasher, although that one worked for me. And then uh, it keeps going. But this is what we're really talking about. When I am decided and I'm moving in a consistent direction, and let's just take one really simple. Let's just talk about our own church right here. Our church will always be what it is until we believe it can be more than it is. Believe to the point that we are actually willing to change the way we talk about it, to change, change the way we pray about it, change the way that we see it. Because we don't just see it today, we see it for what it can be and will be. And when we believe it, and when we believe it, it changes the way we act in here. It changes the way that we, don't, we give money. It changes the way that we give time. It changes the way that we talk to others. It changes the way we talk to people who aren't even in here about what's going on here. But if we believe this is all there is, then we talk like we talked before we got here today. Unless you already believe there was more than what is here. I know that sounds all Dr. Seuss-like, but are you following me? You follow me what's happening there? It's this, when I am decided, it changes my life. When I am decided, I can move mountains. Now, I've never seen a mountain be moved into the sea, but I know this. If you go throughout history books, time and time again, there is mountain-moving events that happen. But what we fail to see, usually when we look back, is the timeline it took for that to happen and how things went. It took 40 years to get into the promised land, but that was a mountain-moving event. It takes time. It takes constant effort. It takes us staying focused and believing. Why am I walking circles in the desert? It's because there is a promised land. There is a promised land. 
Do you think people thought Moses was crazy? Of course. Of course, but he kept going and kept leading, and he believed. The, book, the, the example in the book is Christopher Columbus, and if you've ever read his diaries, they were just days from Christopher Columbus not being on the ship anymore. But he believed that they were going to get to land. Now, he didn't think America. He thought he was going to show up on the other side of the continent, right? But he believed. And when you believe something, then you, it changes the way you act. The doubt seems to disappear. Because doubt exists in that trying area. Doubt is one of those things that causes you to live at odds with yourself. It means that when it looks convenient and right and easy, I'm going after it. But if it requires anything of me that really I'm not willing to give, I'm out. I'm out. You know, when you go into the sports world, you can see this pretty easy. And I'm sorry, that's where I usually live. It probably is true in the baking world. It's probably true in every world you can think of. When you're in the middle, you can tell when people are out because when it gets costly, it happens. You see it every day in the business world. If you're going to want to be on top in business, you're going to have to sacrifice more. If you're going to want to be on top in your spiritual life, you're going to have to give some more time to God. And it may be as simple as opening the Bible, praying, or whatever else. You fill it in. But if you're not willing to do that, you're going to be exactly where you are. And that becomes the reality that you have. And it becomes something that becomes more pretend because you're going to believe we're growing. Great things are happening. But really all you're doing is convincing yourself is the same thing every day is what this life is about. And I don't know about you, but Groundhog Day was the most irritating movie I ever saw. (laughs) All right. So I want you to think about how we live out our faith. There's no pretending We have to be in a mindset where we're after something in the sense that we know growth when growth comes. Because I know how I think in my own head, I'm going to convince myself there's change when it's not. When I go on a diet, somehow I miraculously think, man, that's pouring off of me. I think I can have some chocolate now. (laughs) Don't you think that way? Yeah, I mean, yeah, great. There's some change, so yeah. I really don't change anything because the purpose of the diet is not to lose weight. It's to change the way I treat food. As horrible as it is, it is the way I I treat food. So when you go about faith, it's more about my relationship with God and being open to what it will take to grow that relationship. Because if I'm going to want to get healthy, I'm going to have to be open to changing the way I eat. (sighs) That depresses me. Okay. But God does not. All right, I want you to think about this doubt. It's internally divided. There's no peace. Jesus told the story of, of two men building their homes upon a rock and the other upon sand. You might remember that because it's veggie tales. It's everybody took that story. And when the storms came, only one home survived. And that's exactly what I look at. Why would one person build their home upon the sand? Why didn't they take the time to build it upon the rock? Well, I'm going to just make an, incl- an idea of having built homes. When you don't have to take the time to put in the foundation and everything, it goes quicker, it's cheaper, and it's easier. And you know what happens? When anybody in life wants to go the cheap route in real estate, and that's just the one I know and I believe it's true for everything, they immediately rationalize how it's going to work. It's true. Yes, I can take the cheapest route because let's go with the house. I don't believe I'll need a foundation here. The weather in Boise is pretty temperate. Rarely do we have rainstorms or rain. And guess what? It's going to happen. Just think about your life. I can take the easiest route because later I can take the harder route. Or later I can do this. Or because it's really sufficient because I'm still better off than the person who sits next to me every Sunday. Oh, I know no one thinks like that. I apologize. (laughs) Destination unknown. You know, when you're in doubt, you never know where you're going. Life is governed governed and shaped more by the immediate than the desired life direction. When you doubt, someone else is taking your life somewhere. You're not in control. When you're in doubt, something else is pulling you and guiding you. And then you start using words like spontaneous. I have news for you. Spontaneous is just a conditioned response. You're not creating anything new. Because you know what? You'll respond the same way when you're given the same opportunity every single time. So in doubt, you're going to keep the same thing going, same thing going. We use spontaneous to feel like our conditioned habits are okay. And I I have studies to back that, guys. (laughs) I really do, but guys, I want you to know something. That's the way we think. 
That is just so how we think. We want so many things to make things okay for us to just stay where we're at instead of moving forward. And most of all, we like doubt because I often hear this. I just want to keep my options open. You know what? When we're talking about hairbrushes and things like that, open options are great. But when you're talking about a life direction, every day you waste matters. So I want to kind of shift a bit. What keeps you afraid? What are you afraid of? Because it seems like there is something that causes us to not want to make that decision. I'm in. I have the decided heart. 1 John 4, 17 through 19 says this. Actually, would you backtrack with me for one second? Because when we talk about doubt, I want you to hear what James has to say. And this is on your handout. It's James 1, 5 through 8. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him, that being you and me. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like the wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. If he is double-minded man, he is unstable in all of his ways. Oh, that's a hard verse. Here's the truth I'm going to confess to you about my life. There have been a lot of times I have asked God for wisdom and help. But I've been double-minded in my ways. And then this is how, this is how mature I am. I then get mad at God for not giving me what he should. I know I'm alone in that as well. But can you relate? So often I think God should, should act in a way that's totally contrary to what we're learning here. And then in 1 John, I love this. Why are we afraid? And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him. And he and God. And so, no, so, and, we, and so we know and rely on the love of God that God has for us. Because God himself is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. Because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love. But, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Perfect love casts out fear. If there is anyone on earth that should be living a decided heart life, it should be those who claim Jesus as their savior. It should be those that know him as friend. And it should be those that are ready to follow and live a Jesus life. And here's the hard fact for myself and for us that claim that. We have no excuses. We have no excuses. I want you to think about perfect love casts out fear. Perfect. There's nothing, wanting nothing. There's nothing that could make Jesus' love for you bigger, deeper, more complete than it already is. There's nothing. The love that can absolutely love you as you are and then free you to be as Jesus created you to be exists. Nothing is holding that love from you but you. Same for me. Cast. Meaning this. When that love enters your life, there's the truth. When you accept Jesus' all-consuming love of you and for you and allow it to be an absolute passion driver in your life, it casts out all fear. It means you can let go. You can throw away. You don't have to carry that fear anymore. But don't get me wrong. Danger, that's a very real thing. But fear, that's in your head. That's what you and I create or what we think or what we believe might happen and has never happened yet. But that perfect love casts out that fear. And fear exists often because we believe in punishment. I want you to think about that. Do I believe punishment? Man, I punish myself all of the time. All of the time. Let's just talk about facts. I've been a Seahawks fan since 1976. I know what punishment is like. (laughs) Punishment. You, You can fill that in. You know what it's like. But this is one thing I do know. Jesus didn't come die on a cross, profess his love, live a life before us so that we might see how complete life can be, so that I could live my life feeling punished, afraid. 
buried under, everything about Jesus was about breaking free from the things that keep us down because of his love for us, because of the work he's done for us, because of the work he does in us, because of his presence in the world today, because he's waiting for you and I to just break free. I want to read to you just an excerpt that came from one of Brennan Brennan Manning's books. I had the pleasure of meeting Brennan Manning. He's unfortunately a Saints fan. But he was one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. He had the pleasure of meeting somebody from Africa. And and Brennan was such a down-to-earth guy. But he said, you know, there's just something about being outside of your normal everyday life that you get to see things differently. So this, this missionary went over to Africa, and the situation there, he, had, he saw things completely different. And breaking, he thought he was living a life that was pleasing to God, but when he got out of it, he realized that he was cheating himself of what God had for him. And it was because of fear. It was because of letting others influence him. Now listen, when I read this, I want you to know, I believe there's such thing as too churchy. I really do. I mean, there's sometimes when church talk goes on, I just want to leave the room. But you know what I do believe? I do believe you can't get enough of Jesus. I do believe there's so much there that we do more to to stop him from filling our life than opening our life to him. I do believe that we suffer from having doubtful hearts about our spiritual walk. And I believe it shows up in all of our life. Because I'm guaranteeing you this morning, if you struggle with your spiritual life, it's going to show up in your home, it's going to show up in finances, it shows up at work, it shows up in how you live every single day. It shows up everywhere. And here's somebody that finally made a decision. And I just like the fact that he made a decision. And I like the way he describes it. He says this. You can read with me. I think it's page three in your handout. He says, I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit power. Now, that's kind of church talk, but let's say this. He's not afraid anymore. There's nothing worse than somebody that's not afraid for the comfortable masses. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his, that being Jesus. I won't look back. I'm not going to let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. I lean in his presence. I walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few. My guide is reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, or pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I have stayed up and stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. Because I'm a disciple of his. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, He will have no problem recognizing me because my banner will be clear. You and I question, is your banner clear? I'm going to be first to say, I'm not sure mine always is and I need to work on it. Need to work on it. And so that's why we are over time, guys, because I'm a normal pastor sometimes. But I have this on the back, just four questions. Four very important questions. Because if you leave here today without making a decision, we just had a meeting. We talked. That's pretending if you leave and think that alone makes the difference. That's just pretending. That's what they call playing church. You have to leave with a plan. 
You have to leave with an idea. You have to leave believing and knowing that Jesus has something for you. And he's just waiting for you to get after it. It's coffee talk. It's where we talk about stuff and we make some decisions. So I'm going to ask if you can. I mean, if you have kids you need to go get, I sure get it. I've been in there in those rooms before. But if you can take just four more minutes and answer these questions, it's probably going to be more like eight minutes and answer these questions with somebody. I want you to pair up with somebody. It doesn't have to be someone you know, and you can even talk to yourself, whichever you're most comfortable with. Although most people think you need counseling when that happens. Let's pray real quick, and then you can keep talking as long as you want. Jesus, I just want to thank you for the fact that you're a God who truly does bless us in that you've invited us to a life that is abundant and true and sincere and blessed. And I pray, God, that we would begin to remove the obstacles that we put in front of that and in the way of that. And have a mind that is clear and eyes that are open and ears that hear. That we wouldn't be confused but be decided in our heart. And that decidedness, I pray it would show up in how we live. I pray we would be decided in our spiritual life and our relationship with you. We'd be decided about our church family and how incredible of an opportunity you've given us here at the journey. And we'd be decided about one another and realize the blessing that we have to be together each Sunday and grow. And that we'd be decided in our families and in our marriages and as parents We'd be decided in our everyday life that it would show and how we show up at work or wherever we go. And that in all of this, that you're planned for an enormous blessed Boise, Idaho would become real because some people decided to be a part of it. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace, your love, and the incredible opportunity we have to live the decided heart, life that you've set before us. May we not doubt, but may we follow.